Hey everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here with a recent reads video, and I say recent reads because I'm really just talking about books from mid-May up until now, but I haven't properly done a recent reads or a wrap-up type video since November, so thank you for being patient in case I'm pretty rusty with this. And I'd say it's pretty apparent how absent my reading has been this year with some obvious reasons with how the world is right now. So apart from being distracted in that way, I've also been pretty distracted with work um, with work, I've been busy, but I've felt often that I've been working when I'm not working or when I'm off the clock. But I'm realizing just how much energy it takes for me to sort of sever my professional and my personal life while working from home. And I'm super fortunate to be working from home in the first place. But making videos and reading whenever I do feel like reading has definitely been a great respite for me. And luckily for me, with my past recent reads, I've had some great top reads of the year, so I wanted to start off this video by talking about those books. And those two books are Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan and Luster by Raven Leilani. Like I said, these are two of my favorite reads of the year so far, and I have individual reviews of them up on my channel already. And it's no surprise that these are two books about bumbling 20-somethings, which is exactly my reading medicine, but taking off my rose-colored glasses for a second, I do really think that these are two books that are so expertly done when trying to outwardly comment on something about being a 20-something in the late 2010s. And while there are other books out there like Normal People by Sally Rooney, which is championed as being this millennial guidepost, I liked Normal People and I really like Rooney, but I feel like where her stories are so much more shaped for me around the deeper look at romance and kind of what you can still write about with that is really a specific perspective unlike luster and exciting times which again i feel like are trying to be more macro versus micro claire from claire reads books did a really great video recently featuring luster and exciting times which is actually a sequel to an already amazing video that she did about millennial literature. So I really recommend checking out these books and also checking out Claire's video, so I'll be sure to link it down below. So I guess to be fair when talking about recent reads, I should also, I guess, talk about Death in Her Hands by Tessa Moshbeg. I definitely did not feel as positive with reading this as I did with Luster and Exciting Times, and I really just blame that on having read Moshbeg already because reading this one feels like just reading a Moshfeg syllabus, if that makes sense. It has all the ingredients of a Moshfeg book, like having a fatigued female character, a resistance or opposition to societal norms, and some desire to disappear in one way or another. In Death in Her Hand's case, it's probably actually maybe Moshfeg's most philosophical novel, but at the same time, that feels like its own hindrance with our narrator, Vesta, basically just talking to herself the entire time, which doesn't feel really refreshing or dynamic at all. Not to mention that this book reminded me so much of that drive your bones over the plow or something like that that I read earlier this year, which I also thought was just okay, so I wasn't really impressed with this naturally. So I would say this is a great contribution to the Moshfeg library, but I would definitely recommend your entry point being either Eileen or My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Moshfeg. The next book I wanted to talk about was The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri. So earlier when I was speaking of 20-somethings, this book kind of partially talks about a 20-something and his name is Goggle. But The Namesake is one of those books that follows Goggle throughout his whole life. But at least throughout his 20s, Goggle is pretty much living an affluent lifestyle by going to an Ivy League school dating women and resenting his Indian parents. Having read Lahiri's short story collections already, including The Amazing Interpreter of Maladies, it's clear that her trademark is writing about the immigrant experience. So Goggle's conflict is early in life, whenever he realizes that his name is so non-American, making it hard for him to feel like he can adapt to an American lifestyle. To Goggle's credit though, there are times when his parents are a bit not very sympathetic to really small details that I think are perfectly encapsulating how immigrant parents possibly don't understand the full context of what it's like to feel in this in-between. Like when Goggle's parents announce that for about eight months they're gonna go back to Calcutta, India and live there for a while 
And then Gogo asks what that means for him going to school and his friends. And his parents say that the school never seemed to mind before whenever he would just not come to school. So Lahiri is completely in her element with crafting characters that both undermine but also sympathize cultural would disconnect. Strangely though, I found the brief focus of other characters that weren't Goggle way more interesting than Goggle himself, like Goggle's parents or a later character that's introduced named Mushimi. So I prefer Lahiri as a short story writer just because there are so many examples in the namesake where it seems like even in the span of five pages, she's able to characterize someone so well in such a short amount of time with so much information that it makes me feel like I'm reading about a real person. This is me probably just being a bit unfair, but just knowing that Goggle is this straight guy that seems like his biggest angst or concern is not being able to date women very well and having to struggle going to these high-end parties made me feel like I couldn't really relate to him at all or really care about him. But that definitely comes from, I think, where I just find men in real life really boring anyway. So the namesake, I think, is a great expansion or demonstration of Lahiri's ability to craft characters, but I think I much prefer and would much more recommend people start with her short story collections, especially Interpreter of Maladies. Up next, I wanted to talk about The Other Bennett Sister by Janice Hadlow. This book focuses on Mary Bennett during and after the events of Pride and Prejudice. And out of all the books I'm talking about today, I definitely enjoyed Mary the most as a character. And initially I was wondering why this story just didn't begin after the events of Pride and Prejudice, but the whole thesis of Mary is how she tries to articulate her constant ostracization from her family and specifically the success of her sister's marriages. And with her family, Hadlow definitely leaves no stone unturned because I feel like when reading this, I really felt for Mary and how sad and depressed and lonely she was within living within the Bennett family. And getting to read about the Bennett family through Mary's perspective really felt like Hadlow had this researched tone because I think she knew she had to back up this evidence of maybe throughout the years of what readers always wondered what the Bennett family was like. And overall, readers throughout the years having general thoughts or more questions about Pride and Prejudice. For example, with things like why are Mr. and Mrs. Bennett married to each other when they don't like each other? What if goofy Mr. Collins is trying to find love as sincerely as any of the other Bennett sisters? And perhaps my favorite being how Hadlow flushes out Charlotte Lucas and we get to know more about her throughout this book. So I think by including Mary's perspective with simultaneous events happening within Pride and Prejudice, just shows that Hadlow understands how this is both an homage and continuation of the Austin universe. With the writing, I do feel like the style is actually very familiar to Austin's and I feel like the character's behavior is really organic to what I would think they would actually do. But what really sold me is how sharp and touching the love story that Hadlow introduces for Mary in this book because it wouldn't be an Austin retelling without a love story. And there's a certain part when two characters begin to flirt with each other by recommending to each other some books, and that's whenever I knew I was a victim. As soon as I read this part, I knew I was done for, and I remember it was pretty late at night, and I just laughed, and I closed my book, and kept laughing until I got to my bedroom and fell asleep. And this might just be me reliving my self-sabotaging behavior with this subject matter, but Mary's sense of voice throughout the book actually reminded me of Celine from The Idiot and with a touch of Elena from the My Brilliant Friends series. And for you Austin aficionados, I would say Mary is a combination of Fanny, Anne, Eleanor and Catherine. So definitely check this book out if you're an Austin fan. I feel like you would really enjoy it. A segue into the next book, speaking of Austin, I wanted to talk about What Matters in Jane Austen by John Mullen. John Mullen gives these really specific mini theses on really specific topics within the Austin universe. The tone of the essays is really straightforward with back-to-back -back evidence, so there isn't really a lot of room for Mullen's subjective curiosity within the essays, except for the introduction, which I really encourage people not to skip. I think it's like a perfect beginning presentation of why this book exists. And for me, that would be by identifying not only Mullen's enthusiasm with Austin, but sort of 
you know, saying that it happens to all of us who read Austen that we feel compelled or have this impulse to just pick up her book and reread it. So some of my favorite essays in here are including one about the risk of traveling to seaside, the formality of how characters name each other, what makes characters blush, and so many other gems. I dare call this collection essential just because again to reiterate as soon as I finished this I just wanted to pick up the closest Austin book nearest to me. Up next I wanted to talk about Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin. This follows a boy named Johnny and his afflictions with his identity alongside religion. And a lot of his turmoil comes from his strong dislike towards his father Gabriel. So the structure of the book takes on these different perspectives from other characters which is effective but I think sacrifices sort of a sense of momentum. Each character navigates shame with religion as a way to reinforce their own moral dilemmas. And I like how the story considers matching an introduction to religion as a mirror to formative symbolism with adolescence. Even if we grow up not to be religious, I think everyone at some point has a conception of how meaningful religion becomes to their lives. And Baldwin crafts so carefully this construction of religion through the perception of different characters within the context of the early 1900s. In a strange way, with this being my third Baldwin novel, I feel like this one as a debut felt more like a demo with how later Baldwin would become more successful at balancing character and story. Where Go Tell It on the Mountain, I think, is effective at characters wrapping themselves around floating themes. I think if Beale Street Could Talk and Giovanni's Room has more specificity for the themes asserting themselves onto the character so overall, a good book, no complaints, but I would recommend starting out with If Beale Street Could Talk or Giovanni's Room. Moving on to nonfiction, I have We Are Never Meeting in Real Life by Samantha Irby. I read Irby's later collection, Meaty, and really enjoyed it, but I was curious about Irby's earlier essays to see if maybe the strongest ones were hiding in there, and I feel it's impossible not to find the charm in being able to revisit an Irby essay because her writing is so familiar and disguised as being funny and being so candid, but it hides some really heavy subject matter sometimes. Similarly to Meaty, Irby does bring up this misfortunate sense of her early life, where she mentions the debilitating nature of her mother in Meaty. She does the same here. But a clear standout for me is how Irby also describes her father in this collection. Despite the grimness that Irby faces within these essays, she never fails to dish out this sense of comic relief to her own life, which never feels jaded. Instead, Irby's sense of humor is effortless in its presentation, even if it doesn't become effective. By that, I mean to say that I think Irby is someone that knows that getting to the punchline of a joke is only as effective as the story that's still captivating to get you there. It's kind of remarkable how Irby feels ahead of her time with her sense of voice, just because it feels so authentic to this default deadpan affect that's so familiar within online literacy now. And she's used to this because her writing career started off by doing blogging. And there's no detection of a tone of trying to pander to a younger audience. And this is a bit of a sidebar, but I think that only is proof because of how recently, especially, I know that Irby's been doing interviews for her new book and also interviewing other writers like Raven Leilani, who wrote Luster. I'll be sure to leave that link to that interview between Irby and Leilani because I think it was so good. But overall, I would say definitely pick up any of Irby's collections. I think between Meaty and this one, I think they're both really satisfying. Up next, I wanted to talk about Things I Don't Want to Know by Deborah Levy. This is the first installment in a series of memoirs by Levy. And this one is about her approach to writing, which gave me vibes of being a version or homage to Wolf's A Room of One's Own. She starts talking about her childhood and she feels this large sense of distraction that writing gives her which she finds solace in, but also isolation. And she contributes writing as this sense of distraction as being also a sense of catharsis with investigating her memories and realizing upon reflection that her dad was actually imprisoned while she was younger. So in a way, her realization of this causes her to be suspicious towards life. And thus, that's where the title comes from, claiming that there are just some things that she does not want to know. Levy states, 
If I thought I was not thinking about the past, the past was thinking about me. And she takes the same sentiment towards her own writing, feeling more comfortable with favoring instinct and impulse towards her writing. Perhaps as the most honest way of writing about women without making them this distortion or delusion while still giving them attention. I read Hot Milk by Levy a few years ago and I thought it was okay, but upon reading this memoir by her, I think it definitely makes me want to revisit it and inspect how I really appreciate knowing that Levy feels like someone that values writing as being so integral to her way of life. And finally, I have Crudo by Olivia Lang, which is this hybrid of fiction and nonfiction. Lang creates this version of the writer, Kathy Aker, who's in her 40s in the summer of 2017, and she's getting ready for her wedding. But she's constantly aware of the status of the world with Trump and with the use of pronouns becoming more commonplace in identity and other things. The closest thing I can compare this to is the rhythm of reading something like from Rachel Cusk's Outline Trilogy with the investigative tone of something akin to a work by Maggie Nelson. Kathy talks a lot about especially her bewilderment towards media with things going on like on Twitter, or TV or Instagram. And with this constant exposure to information, I think she's trying to match that towards her desire to always wanting to be alone. Based on her admitting that she's always been in unsatisfactory relationships, both philosophically, but also with men specifically, Kathy notes, she liked being by herself, kept company by her old pals, hankering and craving. She would liked living in perpetual adolescence, never having to be responsible for anyone else. Were other people as bad as Kathy? Did they wake up out of it in shock at their own intractability, their own bad taste? So I took this as a way to translate that Kathy's wondering if do we ever have anything to contribute if it's not an opinion and if it's an opinion that people would even listen to, which is just as much of a doomed concept as Kathy feels like she's being so exposed to in the summer of 2017. And by Kathy being this vessel of being this version of an anonymous bystander towards the summer of 2017, she tries to equate these events to her own life whether that be preparing for this marriage or thinking about her upcoming trip to America. Although little does she know that 2020 is going to be so much worse. So a part of reading this book is I thought it was fine, but I was just beyond the point of comprehension to even remembering some things I forgot about the summer of 2017, but just knowing how awful 2020 is now this in a way feels like I was reading something so dated. So I couldn't really concentrate on how effective this was because I was too much in a headspace of being the reader I was now in this moment, which begs me to say that I think reading Crudo is really hit or miss depending on what stage of your life you're at or maybe whenever you read it in a few years from now when hopefully things are so much better. Unlike Lang's previous nonfiction work being The Lonely City, which I really liked, I think that book does a better job at Lang maintaining this thesis throughout combining some nonfiction context with her own personal life. Whereas in Crudo, I think Lang gets a bit distracted with trying to maintain a narrative, even a really flimsy one. And so those were all some books that I read recently, and I really hope soon I can do another recent reads wrap up type video with the classics I've been reading because I want to share those too. But as always, thanks so much for watching. I hope you're doing really well, and I'll see you next time.